Let's get started for our regularly scheduled program. If you will all rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. All right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. At this time, I would like to call the meeting to order. Community members who desire to submit an oral gener general public comment or an oral comment on a specific agenda item can submit your request to speak via the following email. Oral public comments at coronaca.gov. All requests to speak must be submitted before the conclusion of the public participation portion of each agenda item. I will orally announce the deadline for each item after the item is called for consideration. Please observe a three minute limit for communications and once your call and once your call is connected, we request that you state your name and city of residence for the record. For the public participating telephonically, please dial star nine or press the raise hand button if participating via Zoom. Um, this will raise your hand so that the city clerk is aware that you have submitted a request for oral comment. I will give notice of at least one minute before the deadline. We're gonna to begin today's meeting with some recognitions. The public can now submit a request for telephonic oral comment on the recognitions. The request period for each recognition item will close at the conclusion of each item or after one minute from now has passed, whichever sooner. Our first presentation is of military banners. You will see these banners across town. These are Coronans that are serving to protect us and they're, they are doing so with lots of honor and with all of our support behind them. Um, after their tenure, we take the banners and we give it back to the service members. And although they could not be here with us, I'd like to recognize them and uh, we can give them a round of applause after, after we've named them all. So recognizing the following recipients that were not able to attend to receive their military, ban military banner, but we would like to thank them for their service. Manuel M. Flores, the fourth, who served in the Army. Jacob Delgado, who was in, served in the Marines. Isaiah Dallas Luna, who served in the Navy. And Gilbert Castro, who served in the Marines. Evan R. Leal, who served in Marines. Christopher James Jackson, served in the Marines. And Alexis Strong, who served in the Navy. If you'll join me to give them a round of applause. Okay, our next recognition is for the Friends of the Corona Public Library. I would like to invite Kathy Wright, Terry Jaggers, and Jan Armijo to join me at the podium to receive the recognition. Thank you. This recognition is from all of us from the city of Corona. I won't name it all for you, but it is um, uh, recognizing your efforts, especially during this difficult year that you all still remain and were resilient and still fundraised and made sure to provide uh, virtual events that folks could engage in and donate. And I know that you know from all of us and from the library and from our community who benefit so greatly from all the work that you do with the Friends of the Corona Public Library, we just wanna thank you and recognize you today. I'd like to offer the mic if anyone would like to say a few words. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here to receive this. Um, it's kind of a mixed feeling today because the library director and recreation services director, David Montgomery Scott, will be leaving on Friday. So we thank him for his leadership. He's helped make us a better group. And we appreciate the council for their support of the Friends, and we look forward to new council members joining in and being supportive as well. But we thank you. We want to make sure that people know where the library is, and that's the job of the Friends. So thank you very much. Ladies, before you, before you go, I, I just want to tell people these three women are, and their army of volunteers are amazing. I mean, flat out amazing what they do, how much money they raise, how dedicated they are to serving the public and serving the people that come to the library is 
is it's beyond anything of your imagination. And if you want to volunteer and you want to work with an amazing group of people, these are the women. That is the group. Please do it. It's it's a it's a fulfilling a fulfilling thing. And if you're not a member of the Friends, um, please join. Ten dollars a year. Fifteen dollars a year. Best fifteen bucks you ever spent. Um, and when 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 the uh, uh, bookstore is open, please go and buy some books. They're they're cheap and they're great. And they have CDs too. It is open. Perfect. Go do that. Thank you. Our, our next recognition is for Off-Broadway Corona Theater, OBC Theater. I would like to invite Amanda Kalkanis and Nancy Gettinger to join me at the podium to receive the recognition. This recognition is from all of us in the city, from the entire council, to you and OBC Theater, for all that you do, your great partners, you come out and not just create events, but really support the community. And so we're just so very grateful. And we just want to say thank you and recognize you on this day. And I'd love to give you the space if you'd like to share some words. Thank you. Thank you to City Council. Thank you to the Parks and Rec Department and David. We're going to miss you so much. Uh, we are incredibly blessed to get to partner with the city. And um, on, especially this year, when we've needed special events more than anything, with the Letters of, San Letters of Santa and Halloween weekend, We've been so blessed over the past few years, and we're looking forward to many, many more events. Thank you. All right, this next recognition is for three of our leaders who are retiring at the end of the year. Um, I would like to invite Chief Johnstone, Tom Coper, and David Montgomery Scott, if you will join me at the podium to receive your recognitions for your retirement. <laughs> Gentlemen, I'm really sad that you all are leaving us, but I understand you're moving on to greener pastures. So let's start with David Montgomery Scott. We've got a plaque for you and a recognition from the city for your years of dedication, for your leadership, for your contagious energy, for everything you've done for the community. We can't thank you enough. We hope that you really enjoy your retirement. We're going to miss you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and next up, Tom Coper. Tom I think I've, um, I'm an, I have an honorary engineering degree um, right. because of everything you've taught me. Thank you so much. This is a plaque and a certificate of recognition for your 30 years of dedication to our city, to our community, for everything that you've done, for your patience with all of us, for your um, readiness, and for your dedication to just improving our city's infrastructure and all, all that is public works. We really Thank appreciate you. you. And lastly, recognizing Chief Johnstone. Um, for his years of dedication with the service, for his leadership, a plaque and a certificate from all of us. And really, um, this has been an incredible year in all the words, all the ways that incredible actually means. <laughs> and I'm so glad that you were at the helm and our leader during those moments when we needed you most. And we just, I'm really, really grateful for, for you, for having you here. And although I'm sad to see you go, um, I'm just so lucky, we were so lucky to have you for the time that we did. So, thank you. I'd love to give the floor to these gentlemen if you'd like to say a few words. Mr. Montgomery Scott. Yeah, I, I don't do this often. I usually leave that to uh, Jason and Arabi. Um, you know, I, I started uh, this journey in February of 1988. Um, it's been a long time, but it's been an amazing time. Uh, it's bittersweet uh, in that uh, I leave an amazing profession. Uh, I'm grateful for innumerable people who have made a tremendous impact. Um, just hope somewhere along the way, with the help of some incredible teams, 
uh, that we've made some small impact on the communities that uh, I've had the privilege of serving. Uh, I'm grateful for my five uh, plus years here in Corona, the people that I've met, uh, the peers with whom I've worked with, the team uh, that we have uh, developed over time and the things that we've been able to accomplish. And I just want to thank uh, my family um, who are already in Texas waiting for my arrival. Uh, Denise, uh, Tavi, Taylor, Tanner, and Talia, I've got four amazing kids, a beautiful granddaughter, Carlin, uh, who uh, when I FaceTimed her today, uh, the, the mayor happened to pop in on that call. Uh, she asked, how many more days, Grandpa? And I said, four days, and I'll be there with you. And I'm really looking forward to that. So bitter in the sense that, uh, that I have to leave what I love, but sweet in the sense that I've got a granddaughter and four kids who can't wait for my arrival, and I can't wait to be there with them. So thank you all. Mr. Coper, would you like to say a few words? Um, yes. I'd like to thank the city of Corona for giving me the opportunity to work for the city for 30 years, to do the thing I love doing, and I probably would have did it without getting paid because I really love doing what I'm doing. Uh, they can keep you around, buddy. No. Uh, <laughs> I'd also like to thank my staff because uh, it's hard to make me look good at times, and they manage to do that all the time. And I'd like to thank my wife because... Uh, she's the greatest in the world, and I love her dearly, that all the nights I came home late, all the mornings I went in early, all the times I complained to her about how bad things were at times, and she always just looked at me and smiled. Uh, so, thank you. Chief Johnston. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, while I recognize my time here was short, I hope it will be seen as impactful in the future. Uh, also, I want to thank the community, the community-based organizations, the faith-based organizations who welcomed me and who welcomed my family to this community. Uh, it truly was overwhelming, and you have my sincere gratitude for that. Uh, where I may have fallen short, I appreciate your understanding and your compassion, uh, and any success attributed to me truly goes to the men and women that are out there doing the job every day. Uh, I can assure you that we will continue to strive for excellence in policing under the watch of Interim Police Chief Bob Newman, uh, and I express my gratitude and thanks to my family for their support through this. So thank you again, Mayor. Mayor Casillas, can I make just oh, a quick comment? Colleagues, yes. Please. Yeah, well, we got three department heads going out the door. That doesn't happen very often all at once. And I'll keep it real brief. Uh, DMS, thank you for letting us call you DMS because it's so much quicker than David Montgomery Scott. So I appreciate that. Loved your humor and your, your professionalism, so thank you for everything you've done. Uh, Tom Cooper, you big lug. I love you. you uh, you're a super, super hard worker. You're one of the nicest people I've ever met, and you've taken my calls you've, uh, on weekends, after hours. Thank you for your efforts. And Chief Johnstone, We've talked, we've heard a few times about steady leadership this evening, and we needed you the last couple of years. We really needed your style. Two, there's two, there's a lot of issues, but two jump out at me. Uh, the Noah, Noah McIntosh murder um, devastated this community, and just having your leadership and your confidence and your compassion, uh, your, um, you were careful when you needed to be, um, and, you know, and you solved the case. And um, that, that's impressive. But, and the other one was just with the, the protests and everybody's on edge and angry at each other. And when you helped de-escalate the protests at Santana Park with your words directly to the organizers and you connected with them, um, that, that was a big deal, that you were willing to meet with them, that, they, that, that you connected. So you, uh, you did a great job. So thank you and, and all three of you guys, enjoy your retirement. I'll, I'll be fast, and it's always tough to follow Jim, but uh, yeah, DMS I, recruited me to uh, the Parks Foundation, uh, and it's been a great experience, and, and I appreciate your energy and your uh, uh, God help Texas. Uh, he's refused to wear a hat. I told him he needed to wear a hat and send me a picture. He said he won't, so I'll have to figure out a way where he is in Texas and bring him a hat. Um, but yeah, you'll be missed. Uh, your, your staff inspired by you every single day, and we can definitely see it. Uh, Tom, I, I, I can't say enough about, you know, <clears throat> the stuff that, that uh, 
that uh, Jim said about answering questions and even when we disagreed and, and you still did what, what we wanted you to do, you still did it with a smile on your face. And, uh, you know, and thank you for always being that wealth of knowledge and, and bringing that uh, uh, depth and understanding and willingness to, to listen to me, you know, complain and, and why, Tom, why can't we stripe it like that? And why can't we do this? And, and thank you so much for, for being that guy. And, and Chief Johnstone, I, <clears throat> I want to echo exactly what Jim just said. Watching you in action was inspiring. And seeing it, you know, happen in real time was like, I felt like I was watching, <clears throat> watching history. And uh, thank you for that. And I appreciate your leadership the last two years. And I know your, your, uh, your men do as well. Thank you. I, I want to embarrass all of them, but I can't because they're all three good men. And uh, what's special to me is uh, I don't think people in the watching this know that Tom Coper's family is here, and they cannot be more proud of him. There, there is nobody in this room more proud of Tom than Tom than Tom's family. And, and Chief Johnstone, I, when he first was hired on, he called me and he said, let's go get breakfast. And I don't know who warned him about me, but someone did. And we, we had breakfast. And it, if you talk to him, it takes all of five minutes to know that he's an honorable and he's a good man. And that's special. And it's special when that dude's your police chief. And David Montgomery Scott, I was... Uh, I was getting kicked out of the library one night, literally, and uh, he stopped everything and, and said, let me help you out, Tom, and I know you battle these historical people, and, and he brought me back into the building, and the next time I went there, there was a list of 20 rules for me to follow, <laughs> but you, you served well, and you knocked it out, and people love you, and and to hear you talk about your family in Texas, I, I might go with you. So good job, all three of you. Even quicker, gentlemen, you deserve your retirement. You deserve everything that you have done. Thank you very much for your service to the city and enjoy your retirement. Well, it's no secret that Corona is great, and we're great because of our team. We have a really great uh, staff that make up our, our team Corona, and several have been here for a long time. Now, many could not attend today because of the restrictions, but we do have a few, and I'd like to call them up for their years of service. And so we're going to call you up one at a time, and then I'll give you the mic, so I'm not going to surprise you, so you can say a few words. Um, but I do want to congratulate you. So... For 20 years of service, first up is Angela Ensign Montanis. Montanis. Thank you so much. 20 years of service. <laughs> Would you like to say a few words? No. Okay, all right, well then let's take a picture. Next up for 20 years of service, Raul Vasquez. <laughs> Raul, thank you so much. We're so grateful. For 20 years of service, Lindsay Walker.
and for 20 years of service, Jesse Quintero. One more round of applause for our 20 years of service members. Thank you so much. Our next group is our 25 years of service. And first up is Nilo Ambries. I forgot one more member in the 20 year club, Shannon Crow. Okay, next up in our 25 years of service, uh, James Ock. For 25 years of service, joining us via Zoom, uh, Joanne Coletta. <laughs> Joanne, you there? I know. Can you say something? Can you be the first to give a speech? Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you. Congratulations, and thank you for sticking with us for 25 years. For 25 years of service, Tom Moody. <laughs> and last in our 25 year club, uh, Robert Newman. All right, I just wanted to say uh, thank you to uh, you, Mayor, for the recognition. Uh, but most importantly, I wanted to say thank you to the Chief. Uh, he did provide two excellent years of service and guidance to not only our community, uh, but myself and the others that will be moving up the ranks uh, to fill his position. Uh, and most importantly, we have a lot of representation for our police department and to the community. Uh, this is why our police department is the best, is because we have solid men and women to provide the service to all of you. So thank you very much. All right, can I get a last round of applause for our 25 year of service club? All right, and last up we have two staff members to recognize for 30 years of service. First up, Richard Avila. Thank you. 
All right, um, and our final recipient for 30 years of service, Tom Cooper. Wow. And those are just the folks that were here today. There are several who could not join us, but thank you from all of us for your dedication to the city, for your great work, and for making us all just look good. So next up, we have a presentation from uh, Mark Uffer, CEO of the Corona Regional Medical Center, who's joining us via Zoom. Um, and before we start with Mr. Uffer, um, if you have any, uh, if you would like to submit your request for oral comment before please do so before the conclusion of Mr. Uffer's update. And we'll turn it over to Zoom. Thank you. Can you all hear me okay? Is it coming through okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, good. Um, I, I was hoping it wouldn't be garbled like, like everyone else. So uh, I want to make sure everybody can hear. Uh, well, thank you for the opportunity to um, talk to you a little bit tonight about uh, hospital update and um, the COVID-19 uh, crisis that we're um, experiencing. Uh, let me start out by saying there is um, really no good news um, relative to the um, impact that COVID is having on the hospital system, not just Corona, but pretty much Southern California, um, Northern California. Um, I could best describe it as a, we're all in a world of hurt. Um, with uh, uh, the light at the tunnel being the vaccine, um, but the light at the end of that tunnel, that vaccine, uh, the impact of that is is not going to be felt by the general public and probably until summertime at the earliest. Um, let's just talk a little bit about corona. Um, let me preface this by saying that um, whatever the public is doing, uh, to um, live with the COVID uh, virus is um, a complete failure. Um, I, I struggle every day with, um, and my peers are struggling. Uh, I was on a call this morning with Riverside County and you know, we thought that uh, we, we saw, you know, this initially struck the uh, the, the uh, public in um, February and March of last year. And it got pretty bad and we had a lockdown and uh, things quieted down and the numbers went down and things were relatively stable. I mean, it was still there, but it was managed. And then we had the 4th of July surge. So, you know, when what happens is, you know, these what causes these surges is we, we relax the restrictions um, and then we have a surge. And so 4th of July was a major surge. Uh, we saw it probably 10 to 14 days after the holiday. And then things quieted back down. Um, and then we had Thanksgiving and uh, Thanksgiving, uh, 10 to 14 days after Thanksgiving, it got bad. I mean, it got really bad. Um, the Thanksgiving surge is pretty much over. And we are, um, the hospitals, none of the hospitals have really any beds. Our ICUs are less than 2% capacity. Um, most of the ventilators are in use. High flow oxygen is in use. Um, the um, the surge continues, uh, and we're headed toward Christmas. And uh, uh, there's been absolutely zero effect of um, uh, the lockdown. I mean, it hasn't it hasn't helped one damn bit. And uh, we expect to see this continue through Christmas and then through New Year's. 
and um, into 2021. Um, I don't know how to describe it other than to say that um, if, if people don't wake up and stop their behaviors, um, this is going to be catastrophic for the healthcare system and the general public. I mean, we're already past 300,000 deaths um, and there's no end in sight. Um, you know, our hospital normally runs 22 ICU beds on a busy day. Um, we're running four ICUs right now. Um, we don't have any beds available. The ER, we're holding patients in the ER. We're putting cots out. Um, we're bringing in two, two surge tents at $60,000 a piece to try to manage the emergency room. Um, I mean, it, it, it is bad. I mean, uh, we're, ha we're having employees getting exposed. Uh, uh, it, it, it's, I don't know how to describe it. Uh, it's like a mash unit and it's not happening just at Corona. Riverside communities in the same situation, Parkview's in the same situation. Uh, we're no longer doing electric, elective surgeries, um, no, nor is Parkview, nor is Riverside Community, nor is Riverside University Health System. Um, if you talk to the healthcare providers, we're all just we're all just looking at each other, trying to figure out what to do. I guess the best way to describe it is there's a tidal wave coming, and we're all standing on the beach watching it, and there's not a damn thing we can do to stop it. I mean, it's going to hit us, and it's going to hit us probably in the next two two to four weeks. And um, frankly, for the general public, um, you know, it's their fault. You know, people continue to refuse, they continue to refuse wearing masks. They, they seem to think that, I mean, we, at first, you know, we heard, we heard Trump say it's a hoax, it's the China virus, it's going to go away. Well, that worked out well. It, it was all, you know, a, 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 a political issue. And as soon as the election was over, it was going to go away. Well, you know, the election's over and it hasn't gone away. It's gotten worse. Um, the, you know, there are people that refuse to wear masks in public. I was talking to one of my employees today, six of her friends went to a dinner party at someone's house. They all six have COVID now, um, because none of them were wearing masks and they weren't socially distancing. And they went to a, an event with, you know, a group of people, they sat around the table and they ate and laughed and yucked it up. And now they're all sick. Um, what happens is some people don't get, um, they don't get uh, symptoms. So they think that because they're positive, but they don't have symptoms that it's not an issue. They're contagious as hell and they still go around people. Um, so we're continuing to see that, you know, if you go to Home Depot, Lowe's, any, any shopping center, the parking lots are packed. Nobody's socially distancing. None of the stores are enforcing the mask rule. So you can go into the store and find people routinely walking around without a mask. Um, you know, the mask protects us, it protects them. They don't seem to get that and they become quite belligerent when they're confronted. Um, in San Bernardino County, where I happen to live, there are restaurants that are openly defying the, the no dining indoors uh, issue. Corky's, for example, and Yucaipa is open for business as usual. Um, the Mill Creek Cattle Company is open for business as usual. Um, you go in there and you can find, you know, 40, 50 people sitting around with no masks on, no social distancing, cooks cooking without masks on. And when you confront the Board of Supervisors or the public health officers, they don't want to they don't want to do anything about it. You know, in our own county, you have the sheriff going out there who suddenly become a scientist and um, says that all of this is because of the winter flu season and that's why we're so impacted. Really? Um, that's brilliant. Um, so, I mean, if I'm cynical and I apologize for that, I really don't apologize for it. I'm just fed up with it. Um, uh, we have got to come to grips at, with some kind of a public message uh, to get people to, 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 to shut it down. Um, you know, having, I mean, at first it was, you know, people still having Thanksgiving I and mean, they were still having the big parties. Uh, I, I'm hearing that uh, from one of my pulmonary critical care doctors told me that in her neighborhood, there's routine parties taking place because the bars are closed. So people have just moved it to the homes. Um, it's not going to go away. And, and unfortunately the vaccines, I mean, the vaccines are 
are they're out on the street. Um, our vaccines come in. Uh, we we think they're coming in Saturday. Uh, we think we're going to get um, about 800 doses. Um, and it's you know by requirements the frontline caregivers uh, first that will get it. So these are your doctors that are taking care of patients. These are your nurses. Um, and, and then the long-term care facilities, the nursing homes will get it, the high-risk population will get it. But the general public is probably not going to see this until late January, February, or March, maybe even April. Even with that, you will still have to wear masks. Even with the vaccine, you still have 40% of the population that says they're not going to take the vaccine. So they're still gonna be passing it around and they're still gonna be infecting people and the hospitals are still gonna get impacted. Now, let me tell you the most distasteful part of this. Um, we should be all enraged. We should all be writing letters to the governor. We should be writing letters to, to anybody that will listen. Riverside Community Hospital, um, which is the trauma center in Riverside County, the nurses voted last week to go on strike Christmas Eve through January. I think it's January 3rd. Um, they've uh, asked for ridiculous uh, uh, demands, even though HCA has been negotiating with them nonstop. Um, they're gonna go out on strike. They are gonna shut down the trauma center. They're going to cause immeasurable damage to the system. And they're gonna, they say they need to offload a hundred patients between now and, and uh, December 24th. There's no place to put them. We don't have any beds. So, I mean, you know, we always look at, um, in, in the CEO world, we look at nurses as a noble profession. They are the front lines of healthcare. They're the ones who take care of the patients. They're the ones that are, are there every, every day at the bedside. And these nurses think it's appropriate to go on strike in the middle of the worst pandemic since the Spanish flu. You know, uh, my personal opinion, they should be removed from the nursing profession and their license confiscated. That's my personal opinion. Um, nurses that want to cross the picket lines, I hear are being bullied. Um, on social media. I mean, this is, this is the most distasteful, this is about as distasteful as it gets. So in the middle of all of this, we're all struggling for staffing. Um, the staffing agencies, temporary nurses, are, uh, they're charging us uh, 190 to $200 an hour. So if you, if you, if a nurse works, uh, you know, four days a week, that's 48, 48 hours. They work 12 hour shifts at uh, $190 an hour. And that goes on for months at a time because we can't get nurses right now. Um, it's only a matter of time before the economics of it catch up with the healthcare industry. Um, you know, if you're a place like Parkview that has an operating margin of, you know, one to 5%, you know, it's more like 1%. Um, they're not going to be able to, to continue to operate if they get stuck in a bidding war for nurses. So it's not just the, the virus, it's all the distasteful behavior that's now coming with it. Um, employees are, they're worn out. I mean, my nurses, I mean, I talk to them and, and they're, they are getting a hopeless look on their face because there's no respite from this virus. And it's not because we can't control it. I think Bill Gates had the best uh, take on this. We all have the anecdote. It's in our hands. It's called a mask. It's a respiratory virus. It's spread by respiratory droplets. If you put um, something over your face, it's not going to spread. I can't imagine the thought process that goes into, I'm just not going to wear a mask. I don't care about my fellow human beings. Is it uncomfortable? Yeah, they're annoying as heck to wear a mask. You know, I don't like having to wear a mask, but I wear one. I go, you know, when I'm in, if I go through a drive through when I go up to pay at the window, I put a mask on to protect the person at the window. I carry hand sanitizer in the car. I wash my hands to the point where they're raw. And that's what healthcare workers are doing. In addition to them working 12 hour shifts, 
having children that are out of school. So when they get done doing their shift and taking care of the public, then they have to go home and teach their children and educate their children. Um, I, I just, um, we're at our wits end because we just can't get this message across. Um, I've talked to the board of supervisors. They don't listen, it's a, it's a political issue. Uh, we have politicians, and I, and I apologize for making that general statement, that are making policy about health care. They seem to know more about this than, than, uh, than anyone else, but not one of them has any scientific backgrounds. Um, I mean, if you sense the frustration, just, just listen in, you know, I, I, I would share with you, if you listened into a CEO call, and we have them every week with the county of Riverside and the county of San Bernardino, we're all feeling the same way. We don't really know how to stop this. And I think I just read that one in 80 people have it in LA County. Now the irritation, you know, you know here, here, here's a little more irritation. So I had a personal friend who I've known for 30 years. He came here from Peru and um, he died the, the night of thanks, night before Thanksgiving from COVID. He was 66 years old. And how did he get it? We went to a, a, a church that had one of, the, one of the mega churches and he didn't wear a mask. We think that's where he got it. His wife had it the week before. Um, I know people that have this, the symptoms can range from nothing to full-blown respiratory failure. Um, it, 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 is a, it is a horrible, horrible virus. And there, it's so unpredictable that you just don't know who it's gonna get and what it's gonna do when it gets them. So um, am I afraid of it? Absolutely. I, I guess what I, if I had to sum this up, um, I don't know very many people that if I took a six foot Western diamondback rattlesnake and put it into a, uh, a, a, a room full of people, I doubt that there's very many people that are gonna walk up and try to pick it up and pet it. I think most people are gonna run the other direction, but there's always some knucklehead that will try to pick it up and they get bit. And that's what we're dealing with here with, with the public is that there, there, there's a, I don't know if it's a lack of understanding, a lack of caring, a, a failure to want to be held accountable, but um, people, we got, we got to pick it up. We got to stop this because if we don't, um, that death toll is going to get to 400,000 pretty quick. It could get to 500,000 because the vaccines, we can't get them out there quick enough. Even if you get the vaccine, Monday, you still got 21 more days. So Monday is what, the 21st? So we're through Christmas, we're into New Year's. And while that's all going on, you have no immunity for 20, for you, you, again, 21 days apart. You get shots, you get shot on, on one day, 21 days later, you get the second shot. 14 days to 20 days after that, then you have immunity in 95% of the time. Um, so, you know, that's going to put us well into 2021 for the healthcare workers, but we haven't even got to the general public. So the anecdote is the mask and responsible social behavior and taking accountability and stop doing what we're doing. I mean, I don't even think it's, it has anything to do with businesses being closed. I mean, we can close the business, but it's the behaviors that are going on. If people would wear masks when they went into the store, that would help. But there are people that just won't do it. So um, not, not a very uh, encouraging report, but a very brutally honest report. Um, and I don't, know, um, I don't know how we get from point A to point B right now, but um, again, your hospital in your community is on the brink of not being able to, to do what we do best and that's take care of people. Um, we, we're, we're at that point where it's, uh, um, the resources, I, 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 you know, I'm running out of nurses. I'm running out, I'm running out of healthy nurses. Um, my doctors, I have, I have three critical care physicians that are working, you know, days and days and days on end. They're getting tired and, uh, we need help. We need the public's help, uh, in educating, um, the masses that, um, uh, forget forget what Governor Newsom has done, because whatever he's done has had zero effect. The curve is not flattening. 
people have to be accountable for their behavior and stop doing what they're doing. That's the anecdote right now. And to do that, that means wear a mask, socially distance, you know, don't have a big Christmas party this year. Don't have a New Year's Eve party. You know, it's 90 days or 120 days and we're out of this if everybody's responsible, but they're not. So um, with that, I'll open it up to questions. Thank you, Mark. I really appreciate it. And we're sorry. I mean, I know it's sobering, but it's, uh, it's a necessary message. I will uh, turn to my colleagues and see if you guys have any questions. No? No questions? Mr. Offer, this is Jim. Um, thank you for the, the report. Uh, did I hear correctly that the National Guard um, had been brought in to assist in any way, or is that just a rumor? That the no, hospital. That's factual. That's factual. That's factual. So, they, do they send like medically trained nurses from the National Guard to supplement the the nurses that you, that are out sick? Um, not so much that they're out sick, just more hands on deck. Uh, you know, um, I mean, I I think that the. I was I said it on a call this morning and, and and it was like you could hear crickets chirping, but I suggested that uh, that that they probably the smartest thing we could do right now is to mobilize the government, mobilize the military and uh, have them set up some some field hospitals on each hospital campus. You know, we have that big field next to the hospital or the parking lot set up a field hospital there with, you know, because they they can do, you know, I mean, we've when this country's at war, when we send our troops abroad, we have field hospitals, they have trauma, they have surgery, they have medical units, they have nurses, they have doctors. You know, we need to, we need to call up the military reserves. I mean, it, we have to get drastic right now. And uh, I mean, I think that may help us get through this because the, the hospital staff, they're going to wear out and they're going to break. All right. Thank you for your report this evening. Thank you, Mr. Offer. Let's see. Um... We will open it up to see if there are uh, any comments. Ms. Edwards, did we receive any written comments from the public? Mayor Casillas, we did not receive any written comments. Thank you. Ms. Duarte, did we receive any requests for oral comments? No, Mayor, we did not. Okay, telephonic public participation is now closed. Uh, Mr. Offer, thank you again. Hang in there. Hang in there. We're sending you all of our, all of our, we're, we're praying for you. We're praying for our first responders, and we're hoping that we can get through this. Thank you again for joining us tonight. All right. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to the next portion of our meeting, the going to um, meeting minutes. The public can now submit a request for telephonic oral comment on the meeting minutes. The request period for each meeting minute item will close at the conclusion of each item or after one minute from now has passed, whichever is sooner. Ms. Edwards, oh, do we start the timer now? Yes, Mayor, I have already started the timer. Okay. Has the, has the minute passed? Just about, and we have not received um, any requests. Okay, thank you. Ms. Edwards, did we receive any written comments from the public? Mayor Casillas, no, we did not. Okay, and Ms. Duarte, no comments for oral, oral comments from the public? No, Mayor. Okay, telephonic public participation is now closed, and I will entertain a motion for item seven and eight of our meeting minutes. A second. We got a first from Council Member Steiner and a second from Vice Mayor Speak. Let's take a vote on that. Are we all in? One second, ladies. Okay. 
Has everyone voted? Yeah. Miss Edwards, has that come voted. through? Miss Edwards, has the vote gone through? It's not populating on our screen. Take a voice Do you mind just take an oral vote? We can do an oral vote. Okay. Mayor Casillas? Yes. Vice Mayor Speak? Aye. Council Member Dardario? Aye. Council Member Richens? Aye. Council Member Steiner? Aye. And that item passes five to zero. Thank you. Moving on to the consent calendar. All items listed on the consent calendar are considered to be routine matters status reports, or documents covering previous city council action. The items listed on the consent calendar may be enacted in one motion with the concurrence of the city council. A council member or any person in attendance may request that an item be removed for further consideration. Uh, of note, there have been revisions to item 14 and item 16. The revisions were made to the attachments and copies of the revisions are on the dais and can be viewed online. The public can now submit a request for telephonic oral comment on the consent calendar. The request period for each consent calendar item will close at the conclusion of each item or after one minute from now has passed, whichever is sooner. Um, would any of my colleagues like any of the items pulled? 16 from Richens. 13 and 17. 13 and 17. Steiner, no? Council Member, or Vice Mayor speak? Um, 11, 15, 16, and 18. Actually, take it back, 18 is good. With 16, yes, you won't pull 16. Uh, 15, 16. 15, 16, so 11, 15, and 16. Yes, ma'am. Okay, we are pulling items 11, 13, 16. I'm sorry, let me start over. 11, 13, 15, 16, and 17. Ms. Edwards, did we receive any written comments from the public to pull any items? Mayor, no, we did not. Okay, Ms. Duarte, did we receive a request for oral comments to pull any of these items? No, Mayor, we did not receive any requests, and we are up to the minute. Okay, wonderful. So with the exception of item 11, 13, 15, 16, and 17, can I get a motion to pass the consent calendar? I'll move. Okay. Okay, we've got a move by Vice Mayor Speak and second from Council Member Steiner. Okay, we will do a voice vote for that for the consent calendar. Mayor Casillas? Yes. Vice Mayor Speak? Aye. Council Member Diderio? Aye. Council Member Richens? Aye. Council Member Steiner? Aye. And the consent calendar item passes five to zero. Thank you. Okay, let's start with item 11. I think that was Vice Mayor um, Speak. Thank you. I just had a quick uh, a quick question, though I did talk to Ms. Roper and she, she answered. I just wanted to make sure that um, of the 12 units, nine of them are occupied with uh, folks from the, uh, that they were placed by the Corona Norco Rescue Mission and they have varying dates when they are supposed to graduate from the program. Um, and uh, I, I just wanted to know uh, how that transition, because I think I was under the understanding that the Corona Narco Rescue Commission was still doing the casework for these folks, and I'm understanding that that's not true. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Casillas, uh, Vice Mayor Speak, we have Karen Roper who is on the line who can speak to that. Council members, can you hear me okay? We can hear you. We can Council hear you. Council members, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Loud and clear, go on. So, uh, Vice Mayor Speak, I apologize. The, uh, it's really hard to hear. I don't know if I caught everything, but uh, I will attempt to answer your question. So when the city of Corona took possession of the 12 units back from the rescue mission, they, they owned them through a restrictive covenant and deed restriction. When, they, when the city took those units back, uh, there was an agreement that the existing tenants would be able to stay there for 24 months. 
which is almost set up like a transitional housing program, time limited, 24 months. The rescue mission is not providing case management to these clients. They are higher functioning, uh, formerly homeless that are really just income challenged. And our city's housing department has been doing a really great job conducting the property management on these units. And from what I understand from uh, our housing division, these tenants, because of their income challenges, have indicated that they're very worried about becoming homeless because the affordable housing market is so tight. So what we were trying to do is to uh, propose to your city council some policies that would be set in place so that we could require the operator that will be selected through the RFP process to develop a housing plan for each of the, the tenants that are there. There's 12 units, but three of them are vacant, so we will have those available to us for chronically homeless once the operator is selected, but there are nine units that are currently occupied. And so what we were trying to avoid council members is to, uh, we want to be able to prevent homelessness and, and end homelessness at the goal of the plan. And by virtue of repurposing the units, we didn't want to create homelessness through government action. So we feel that this recommendation will help us to work with the incoming operator to develop a plan for these tenants to find alternate forms of affordable housing. And knowing that the housing market is tight, we even propose for your council to consider if the, when the units are built on um, Second and Buena Vista, if we haven't found any affordable housing by then, that they could be prioritized if your, your council so chooses to prioritize them. Uh, Vice Member Speak, did I answer your questions adequately? You did, you did, no, that was perfect. I, I wanted to make sure that, you know, because we're investing a lot of time and energy and money into making sure this thing works. And with the, the, the shelter coming on, our motel voucher program, and I, I certainly don't want to take folks that have worked through a program and, and then found themselves um, in a place where they can graduate from that, you know, I, I don't want anybody to be on the street because of, because of us. Um, but I am very disappointed that um, the rescue mission didn't continue its casework with these folks. Um, and then again, I, I, you know, I said at the time that I don't want to abandon, I don't feel like we should be abandoning anybody. But I, I am very disappointed that, that that's that's happened, um, and I'm I'm happy to see that that we're we're going to place that as a, a policy for um, <clears throat> the new operator to ensure uh, that these folks get a, a place to go, and we ha we have that that pipeline you know flowing, um, and that you know I want to make sure that and it does say in the the policy that we're going to uh, prioritize. Uh, our operator using outside funding sources to ensure um, that we, you know, keep this primed and and occupied with with people. Thank you. Thank you. Before I open up the floor to my colleagues, if they have more questions, I just want to make mention to the public that you can submit the requests for telephonic oral comment on this item. <laughs> the request period for the item will close at the conclusion of the item, or after one minute from now has passed, whichever is sooner. Do any of my other colleagues have comments on this item, uh, Mr. Dedaria? Okay. Nope. Okay. So with that, I'd, I'd like to, to move. I think we have to wait until oh, that sorry, countdown. I should have said that right yeah. before you started talking. I'm so sorry. I'm getting. I'm just getting the hang of it. Got this time down <laughs> to a minute, too. <laughs> okay. I, uh, being the guy that's new and researching this, I just made a phone call to Virginia Caridi, and this won't take more than a minute. And just asked her, is everything going right? And is this right? And would you vote for this? And she couldn't have said a lot of more praising things than what she said. And that city net and all of this is just great and wonderful. And I'm sure the minute's up, so I'll stop. But this is a great, this is good. This is good. good. You guys better vote yes. <laughs> that, that goes a long way for sure. Okay, I think the minute is up, uh, Ms. Duarte. Uh, so Ms. Edwards, did we receive any written comments from the public? Mayor, we did not receive any written comments. Thank you. Ms. Duarte, did we receive any requests for oral comment on this item? Mayor, we did not. Okay, then telephonic public participation is now closed, and I will entertain a motion for item 11. I'll make the motion. Okay. And a second? 
from. Okay, so we've got uh, Vice Mayor Speak with the motion and Council Member D'Addario with the second. Let's take a vote. Mayor Casillas? Yes. Vice Mayor Speak? Aye. Council Member D'Addario? Aye. Council Member Richens? Aye. Council Member Steiner? Aye. And that item passes five to zero. Wonderful, thank you. Next up is item 13 before we open the floor to my colleague. The public can now submit a request for telephonic oral comment on this item. The request period for this item will close at the conclusion of the item or after one minute from now has passed, whichever is sooner. I think this was Councilmember D'Addario. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I just had a quick question um, in, in researching this, this item. They're, they're currently grading. And so I'm just kind of curious if, we're, if we went out of order on this, just to make sure that I understand this correctly, and it, it's a learning curve for me as well, but they're currently grading, and this motion is to approve a, a grading agreement. And so I, I kind of thought that we'd have to approve the grading agreement before they started grading. Mayor, I'd like to call on Tom Coper for his final comment in a council meeting answering a question. <laughs> Good luck, Coper. Uh, thank you. Yes, they have moved on site and they're starting to move dirt. We did not issue them the grading permit until they provided us the grading security. So we have the security in hand, so we're ensured that it'll be finished. Yes, uh, maybe we should have waited, but they were, they, you know, this uh, uh, a commercial development that everybody wants to get in. So we let them start going a little bit ahead of time, uh, but we do have the security in hand. Can I just follow up? Do you know when you received that security in hand? Uh, before they started grading. <laughs> I, I don't have that exact date. Uh, but we would not have put the agenda report together if we did not have the, re the security in hand. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank Any you. other questions from my colleagues on this item? Okay. Ms. Edwards, did we receive any written comments from the public? Mayor, no, we did not. Uh, Ms. Duarte, did we receive any requests for oral comment? No, we did not, Mayor. All right, then telephonic public participation is now closed, and I will entertain a motion for item 13. Okay, moved by Councilmember Daddario. Second. And seconded by Councilmember Steiner. Let's take an oral vote. Ms. Edwards? Mayor Casillas? Yes. Vice Mayor Speak? Aye. Council Member D'Addario? Aye. Council Member Richens? Aye. Council Member Steiner? Aye. And that item pa passes five to zero. Thank you. Moving on to item 15 um, before I go to you, Vice Mayor. The public can now submit a request for telephonic oral comment on this item. The request period for this item will close at the conclusion of the item or after one minute from now has passed, whichever is sooner. So, Vice Mayor Speak, item 15. I think there was, was there somebody else? Or just, was there someone else who pulled 15? No. No. I think okay. it's 16 that there was. I just have one, one question. Um, how are we doing? <laughs> I know we're, we're supposed to be done by the end of the month, and I know we had some, some complications in the field, but I just wanted to get an update. Mr. Ellis? Yeah, Mr. Uh, Tom Moody is here to provide an update on uh, item 15 as well. Thank you. Good evening, Vice Mayor and Mayor. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, as you know, when we started this project for the Prophery Line Extension, we um, came to you with a, an aggressive schedule of 18 months. That was to get through all of the coordination with the county and with the agencies that were necessary to get the line extension in place. We have been working towards the goal of a December 31st startup. And the letter agreement before you tonight is, is part of that process, which will allow them to energize as soon as the construction side of it is done. We have had a few delays on getting some of the plans and the construction processed and finished before the um, December 31st timeframe. Based on my conversations with Southern California Edison this morning, it does look like we are probably going to slip the construction schedule by about one month. They did tell me that uh, it looks like we should be wrapped up by the end of January, but they did caveat that with 
uh, mid-February. And a lot of that really gets down to just a few uh, final points of scheduling. The last section that we necessarily, um, the last ses <clears throat> sorry, the last portion of it that is necessary for us to complete the connections is to put two new conduits on the Temesco Canyon Bridge going down Temesco Canyon. And this will be the connection for the Dos Lagos uh, portion of the property extension. And we are hanging those conduits on the side of the bridge. And going back through and in reviewing that, we needed to make sure that all those calculations were correct. If you've been out on the job, there have been there is a significant amount of infrastructure that's already in place. The boxes uh, along that route are in place. So it is just that small portion that's on the bridge. And unfortunately, we hit the um, holidays. And so a lot of the crews that Southern California Edison uses for this work are actually out of state um, crews. And a lot of them go home for the holidays during this time frame. So with that, they are, uh, once the plans were final approved, they began scheduling. And again, based on my conversation this morning, it looks as if uh, end of January, early February will be the final completion. Go ahead. Thank you. I, I'm disappointed. Uh, we've been pushing. I know that I've been pushing hard. I know, Mr. Moody, that you've been pushing hard. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm disappointed that, A, that our schedule slipped in. We didn't know about it. Uh, I've been making promises to the, to the public now for 18 months. Um, and I, you know, in fact, I asked these questions uh, less than a month ago and was still told that we were on schedule. So um, I, I understand, um, but I think they should have known that we had, they had their crews that were going to be going out on, on leave. I did hear that we had some COVID related delays. I know that was also on our project that we, a project that we had in place, um, but I also heard through Edison that there, there were some of those issues too. But um, if there's anything that we can do uh, to, to get this in, these people have been waiting and, and, and waiting and thank God we haven't had any, any, uh, any major, we've had some issues, but we haven't had many major, major issues and I'm knocking on everything um, that we don't have any in the next month or so, but uh, you know, whatever we can do, I, I would appreciate it. Thank and you. and I and I take responsibility for the notification. I found out about this about a week ago. I the I hadn't notified you as the council prior to this because I had not gotten a firm date from Southern California Edison on that schedule, and I wanted to put that all in a complete package. And so I, I realize um, sitting here now that even some notice indicating that I didn't have that information should have gone out, and I do apologize for that. And I will say uh, city staff and Southern California Edison staff have done a great job in getting this accomplished. Um, not only have they been working on this, but they have also been working on uh, upgrades to PSPS in our area and a number of other resiliency things around the state. And I, 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 I understand your disappointment. I respect that. And I just want to say that I am still very proud of our staff here. Tom Coper's staff in getting the plans out and getting the plans reviewed, and Southern California Edison for getting where we are today. And I, I know we have challenges, and, and like I said, I, I, you know, both on their side and and our side, and and I, like I said, I, I just can't wait to flip that switch. And I know it's not going to be a switch; it's kind of a letdown. There's not actually a switch to switch, but can I? You can. You guys just, you know, maybe we'll make one for me. So yeah, we'll make one for you. I'm going to switch it. <laughs> anyway, thank you. With that, I'd like to to move it. If well, let's no see. Hold comments. on a second. Um, uh, any of our colleagues have questions? Nope. Nope. Oh, Mr. Didario? Uh, I just wanted to make sure that I understood this. You know, there's been a lot of challenges out with electricity in the Dos Lagos areas. And I don't ever want to commit anybody to saying this is a 100% fix. But just in lay terms, is this going to be a substantial game changer? for electricity stability in that area with the completion of this? This will be a significant improvement. I, um, running both water, wastewater, and electric utilities, I, I could never sit here and tell you today that we will never have an outage or an overflow, um, and that's on electric water or sewer. The 
purpose of this line and the reliability that it provides um, is on the incoming feed. One of the things that we have spoken highly of is it's difficult to uh, provide power that we are not receiving. This will provide that power and the redundancy in receiving that power. There are still single points of failure in the system because of how the system is designed and, and we pick power from Southern California Edison and we, once we get that handoff, we can redistribute it and we try to redistribute it in as many networks as possible, as quickly as possible. But we do still have a few single points of failure that could become challenging, um, even with this project. That being said, we have been working on addressing those also. Um, and so we will potentially still have outages. We, I would suspect that the outage is, will be reduced by 70 to 85%. Um, and that's important because the, that remaining 15% are really the uh, sole point outages where it would take a significant amount of infrastructure redesign to do uh, and to correct those, which we have talked about in our August uh, 6th um, workshop. And we talked about how Edison has the ability to serve those er these areas a little bit differently because of how they can redistribute after... Um, how they can redistribute differently than us. I think in the last 18 months, we've seen these single points of failure. I mean, frankly, like, you know, these one-off crazy things that have happened. And we've replaced, I think, literally almost all of them, right, Tom? I mean, I can't think of anything else. I mean, there still are those those spots. And I know that we've made changes and corrections and, and design changes and SEE's kind of done that with us on the fly. and. And uh, I, I'm very hopeful that this will eliminate, you know, like you said, I think getting a, an engineer to say anything is 100%. It's like, it's like getting a scientist to say something is a law. There, there's only so many. And, and so I, I appreciate the candor, but I, I do think that, that this is a significant, substantial upgrade. I mean, if, if a car happens to, you know, to take out one of the WDATs and, and yeah, that's, that's still going to take the power out. Um, and because we don't have these multiple, these other connections, if it takes off behind where this connection happens. Um, but I do think that this was well worth the investment. I think that, that we're, we've made significant strides, and I'm excited about getting this, this final. Thank you. So with that, Ms. Edwards, did we receive any written comments from the public? Mayor, no, we did not. Thank you. Ms. Duarte, did we receive any requests for oral comment? No, Mayor, we did it. Wonderful. Telephonic public participation is now closed, and I will entertain a motion for item 15. Make the motion. Okay, moved by Vice Mayor Speak and seconded by Councilmember Steiner. We can take an oral vote now, Ms. Edwards. Mayor Casillas? Aye. Vice Mayor Speak? Aye. Councilmember Daddario? Aye. Councilmember Richards? Aye. Councilmember Steiner? Aye. And that item passes five to zero. Great, moving on to item 16 before I open the floor to my colleagues. The public can now submit a request for telephonic oral comment on this item. The request period for this item will close at the conclusion of the item or after one minute from now has passed, whichever is sooner. Uh, Council Member Richens, item 16. I have, good evening. I have one comment and a couple questions. And uh, the first comment is, is as one who lives on Facebook, I, I just want to thank, thank the city for putting it out to a vote for playground designs and that we, aren't, we don't have the old school playgrounds. These are new incoming playgrounds and there's sharks and forts and one only knows what's what. And I, I, I went and checked the vote. There were 783 people that voted on the parks and that was good. My question to, I think David, I think David, is the manufacturer of the parks, do they just give you options to what to choose from or can we design our own parks? Uh, Mr. Ellis? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, this will also be DMS's final comment in our council meeting, so we'll kick this over to him. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, council Member Richards, the, actually the way that this worked was uh, we actually did uh, an entire RFP process where we approached 
a variety of manufacturers uh, around the region and said, uh, these are the three parks we're looking at. Here are some dollars that we have that we can attribute to us because we knew we had a, a, um, a general fund a budget for Mountain Gate, and then we were using Prop 68 funds for Tehachapi and Costa Verde. Uh, so we gave them a, some guidelines. We want it super creative. It needs to incorporate the neighborhoods in which these are going to be located. Uh, we gave them some points of history. We even gave them the two recent examples, both of Lincoln and Santana Parks, in terms of their designs. And we said, give us your best. Uh, we got nine responses. We didn't like any of them. So we went back out. We rehashed it and said, you got to do a lot better than that. Um, we also reached out to a couple of additional um, vendors. And uh, what they then provided, we then took to uh, the Parks and Recreation Commission and said, what do you think? Um, are they creative? Are they thematic? Do they generate uh, imaginative play? What do you think the community's response is going to be? And so they basically picked their top two. And so we took that out to the community as vendor A, vendor B. Uh, and, and each of them had uh, different themes to the various parks. And uh, first we did it uh, in community meetings at the three parks. And uh, we had a, a couple dozen folks who came out. And they voted for vendor A or vendor B. And then we finally took it out to uh, the community and said, which of these uh, manufacturers do you think best provides really creative, imaginative play uh, for the parks in your neighborhood? And that's where we came up with these designs. So they designed them with input from a variety of sources uh, with some clear uh, guidelines for what we were looking for. And that's what you see this evening. Thank you. Do you have more questions? Thank you, DMS. You're welcome, sir. I think I, that's the first time I've ever called you DMS. <laughs> um, a couple comments. Uh, first, thank you for taking it to the Parks Commission and getting them involved. And before you leave to Texas, will you please write a letter, a long letter, to whoever takes your place to please embrace the Parks Commission, to meet with those commissioners and get their input and involve them more than they can ever be involved to where they get to the point they call us council people and say they're busting us, tell them to slow down. Because those commissioners really want to jump in. And if we have a chance to design more parks, if we could float the idea of a citrus theme park and maybe a, a 1913 to 16 racing homage park, if just ideas. I know Norco does the whole barn park and I have small kids. And so speaking as a dad, kids love thematic parks. And like you knocked it out of the park with Lincoln and the other one. And kids just love them. And they'll, they'll go miles. So thank you. And thank you for your last comments. Oh, no, you're welcome. Actually, and just to respond to what you just said about those two themes, there was, in fact, a very detailed citrus theme uh, from one of the vendors. That vendor was not selected. Uh, but there is, in fact, a, a race car theme uh, for Tehachapi Park, which, in fact, has been voted on. Thank you. And uh, Vice Mayor Speak. Thank you. I, I just wanted to ask some questions about the um, how, let's see, Lincoln's been in use for a month or so. Uh, I wanted to see how, they're, how, how that system is based, because we're using the same, the same company, correct? No, actually, uh, the, so the two existing systems, the brand new systems, um, Vice Mayor Speak, are uh, Santana and Lincoln. Those are both Compan systems. Right. So this is an entirely new manufacturer to us. Okay. Uh, Compan, like the other dozen or so uh, manufacturers, had an opportunity to provide some designs. Very disappointed in what we received, right. so, at the, so they didn't make the final cut. Okay. All right. So I, I just... I, I, I guess that was a question. Then uh, I asked some questions about warranties, and you provided, or at least the staff provided me um, with that information about the warranties. And then they look like it sounds like they're pretty standard um, industry wide. That's correct. Yeah, Sta okay. standard uh, industry warranties for the play equipment. That's correct. And and again, keep in mind that the proposal before you tonight is strictly for the right. purchase of the equipment, no installation of the equipment, nor any installation of surfacing. Correct. Okay. Thank you. You that asked about warranties? 
<laughs> yes, I, I looked at all the warranties. You are thorough. They're, that's in, for your, sure. they're in your, they're in your package. <laughs> that's for sure, but you asked about them. That's incredible. All right, Ms. Edwards, did we receive any written comments from the public? Mayor, no, we did not. Ms. Duarte, did we receive any requests for oral comments? We did not, Mayor. All right, well, telephonic public participation is now closed. I'll entertain a motion for item 16. So moved. I'll second. All right, we've got a motion from Councilmember Steiner and a second from Councilmember Richens. We can go to an oral vote. Uh, Ms. Edwards? Mayor Casillas? Aye. Vice Mayor Speak? Aye. Councilmember Daddario? Aye. Councilmember Richens? Aye. Councilmember Steiner? Aye. And that item passes five to zero. Okay, thank you. Our last item on the consent calendar is item 17. I can't recall who it was that pulled that item. Okay, Councilmember Daddario. Oh, before we start. The public can now submit a request for telephonic oral comment on this item. <laughs> you, made, you made it look so much easier. Um, the request period for this item will close at the conclusion of the item or after one minute from now has passed, whichever is sooner. Now, Councilmember Daddario, item 17. Thank you. Um, so I, I just wanted to make sure that I understood the verbiage of this. Essentially, Captain Rodriguez, I believe, uh, is um, has has graciously extended his uh, riding off into the sunset by providing some stability for us um, in this time as we're looking to backfill positions. Um, but there was a, there was a caveat on this that basically says, if I'm, I'm paraphrasing, I just want to make sure that I'm correct, that after uh, uh, his initial time up to February 28, 2021, the interim chief would be able to extend him without any um, uh, uh, voting on from the council. And I don't have a problem with that other than um, in this time of you know, losing a chief, and uh, having an interim, I would like to remove the caveat that says uh, that it could be um, done without vote from council. And the reason that I, the reason for that is because um, this department, uh, the police department, in my opinion, um, is very fortunate to have an interim chief that uh, I believe has the support of the staff that he leads, um, but. Uh, in, in extending out uh, time for Captain Rodriguez, I would like, I would like to, I would like for the uh, interim chief to come back to council and kind of give us an update on how things are going and why they're extending out the need for Captain Rodriguez. If that's the case, uh, I don't think that anybody's going to have any issue with it. But uh, I think there's an accountability piece here that number one, um, our city manager um, finds a suitable replacement for the chief and is working towards that. And just what the status of the department is. How are they doing in this time of um, transition to a new chief um, with the interim chief? And um, just kind of a general status of, of what's going on. And, and I think it would be important for the community to hear, hey, we're moving in the right direction. We're not. These are some of the challenges that we're having. And I'd, I'd like that if, he, if Captain Rodriguez gets extended, it's, it's uh, with a report from the interim chief. Mr. Ellis? Thank you, uh, Mayor. Just to be clear, we'd be happy to provide an update on the police department. Um, that's no trouble. I'm, I just need clarification on on the extension of the retired annuitant status for uh, Captain Rodriguez. Is that is that contingent on an update? I'm just I'm just a little bit unclear on what the request is there. Yeah. So the way I read it is that if after February 28, 2021, the interim chief feels that they still need to extend. Uh, Captain Rodriguez out, it would be the interim chief's decision. And while I agree that he should be the person making the decision, I'd kind of like an update and just give me a status report on how things are going at the PD, making sure that, um, you know, they're, that everything is moving in the right direction and, and that the need to extend out Captain Rodriguez is just. Mr. Ellis, um, if I may, I, I think he's trying to modify the, motion, the, the item. Maybe we just ask for a second. Is there a second on the floor for this modification? Can I get some context from Captain Newman on this? Okay. Sure. Good evening, council members, uh, mayor. Um, 
As you know, we've uh, experienced some uh, significant attrition at the rank of captain in the last year. Uh, we've had three captains retire, uh, including Captain Rodriguez, who retired in September of this year. Um, on, we had a plan to replace that. There was one unexpected captain to retire. Um, so we were um, in a position where we are backfilling the captain positions with very capable individuals. Uh, however, that plan was thwarted when Chief Johnstone uh, provided his uh, retirement announcement as well. So with that, it was integral for us to maintain Captain Rodriguez as he volunteered to stay another couple months to provide that insight and historical knowledge for those of us that, um, and for the two new captains that will be uh, replacing myself as an interim and uh, the chief's position. Um, with that, Captain Rodriguez also has been the lead manager, commander for our public safety enterprise communication project, which is coming near completion. We anticipate providing um, a final uh, presentation to the to your uh, council, hopefully next month. Um, it's a multi-million dollar project, and since he's had the lead, we believe that it's important for him to stay and uh, finish that. It's a, it's a very complicated multi-agency project. So uh, with that, we're asking for his extension to February of 2021. Uh, the current annuitant uh, ex uh, approval was approved by the previous council in September of 2020, but that unfortunately did not give the caveat of an extension in that agreement. And that ends on December 31st of this year. So with that, we're just asking for that extra um, time for January. And to be perfectly honest with you, I don't foresee an extension beyond that time. Thank you, Chief. I, I feel comfortable with this as written, but I'd like to take comments from my colleagues before we entertain the motion that's on the floor. Any, call any comments? What Tony I says. I'd like to hear from Tony. From Tony. I'd like to hear from Tony. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have any issue with... Um, uh, Captain Rodriguez being extended. My only issue is is that in a time of transition where a, a couple captains retired, a chief is retiring, and there's some transition, um, coming back on the 28th of February and just kind of giving us a status of how things are going in the PD, making sure that, you know, um, there's the stability that they're looking for before they decide that they want to extend them um, and that decision would be the chief then as well. I just would like some, some feedback from the chief on the department and the status on that date saying, hey, you know, we need to extend them because we're still, uh, you know, we're still trying to backfill or, or something along those lines. I would just like some oversight from this uh, council on his decision. And I, I don't think anybody's going to disagree with his decision. I just want that oversight on the 28th if they decide that they need to extend them. Give me an update on what's going on with the department. Thank you, Mr. Dario. Uh, Vice Mayor, speak. Uh, I, <clears throat> I've spoken to uh, Interim Chief Newman, and, and I have full uh, faith in, in how his plan going, going forward. And I know uh, Captain Rodriguez doesn't want to stay any longer than he has to. He's, uh, he's, 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 he earned his retirement, and he definitely wants it. Very grateful, and the city should be grateful for him, uh, willing, his willingness to, to stick around. Um, the fact that he has served in, in every single command um, at the, the PD, the, his, his uh, position in this very important and very critical time, um, I, I think it's, there's no problem with asking uh, the interim chief to come back and give us a, a, uh, an update. However, I, I don't want to hamstring um, our PD with, with anything that they, they need to go forward. I have faith in him. I have faith in his command, and, and I'm, I'm perfectly willing to... Uh, to make the motion as, as presented. Well, we have a standing motion on the floor first. So we've got a commitment from Mr. Ellis to come back with a status update on the transition and how our PD is doing um, in February. And so we're comfortable with that, but the motion is to amend this item and that motion is from Mr. Daddario. Is there a second for that motion? Okay, doesn't sec I'll, I'll second it, it's not a problem. Um, can, I, can I make a comment? Sure. Am I out of line? Is, is just separate the issues. So vote on this as is, and then put it on the agenda for a police report in February. And that would 
take care of what Let's Tony's see. asking for. That's my motion. I'm sorry. No, oh. we've already accepted that the update will, there will be a, a, an update on the status of the PD. Well, it's just a motion on whether or not we want to allow for uh, the, the police chief to have the freedom to have the authority to extend if necessary. All right. Then I, I second. If that's what Wes motioned, I'll second. Then we're good. Okay. Um, just to rewind, so do we have a second on Mr. Daddario's uh, motion to remove that authority? Seeing none, that motion dies. So then we continue with this item. I'll entertain a motion for item 17 as written from Vice Mayor Speak and seconded by Council Member Richens. With, um, with, with the caveat that, that uh, uh, right, we have a Chief commitment. Newman comes back and gives us a report um, sometime in February. Right. And we're good on that. Okay, let's take an oral vote on this, Ms. Edwards. Mayor Casillas? Aye. Mayor Speak? Aye. Councilmember Daddario? No. Councilmember Richens? Aye. Councilmember Steiner? Aye. And the item passes four to one. Okay, moving on to communications from the public. This portion of the agenda is intended for general public comment only on items within the council's jurisdiction that are not listed elsewhere on the agenda. Please note that state law prohibits the city council from discussing or taking action on these items. Please observe a three minute limit for communications and once your call is connected, we request that you state your name and city of residence for the record. The public can now submit a request for telephonic oral comments on this item. The request period for this item will close after one minute from now has passed. So now we wait for a minute. Need some waiting, need some some waiting, waiting music. Ms. Duarte, has it been a minute? Mayor, yes, it has now officially been a minute and we did not receive a request. Okay, so Ms. Edwards, did we receive any written comments from the public? Mayor, no, we did not. Ms. Duarte, we did not receive any oral comments. You've just said that. Okay, um, telephonic public participation is now closed. Moving on to public hearings. This portion of the agenda is for advertised public hearing items where formal public testimony on each individual item is accepted prior to city council action. So we'll go to item number 27, um, public hearing for city council consideration of resolution number 2020-146, calling a special election and resolution number 2020-147, declaring the results of the special election for community facilities district number 2016-3, and maintenance services of the city of Corona on the propositions of the annual levy of special taxes within the territory proposed to be annexed, annexation number 21. The public can now submit a request for telephonic oral comment on item 27. The request period for item 27 will close at the conclusion of the item or after one minute from now has passed, whichever is sooner. Does any council member want a staff report on this item? No. No. Council member Daddario? No. Okay. Okay, so no staff report. Uh, public hearing is now open. Ms. Duarte has it. Oh, wait, I move on to Ms. Edwards. Ms. Edwards, do you have proof of publication and mailing of the notice of the public hearing? Mayor, yes, I do. Ms. Edwards, have any written protests have been received? No, I have not received any written protest. Ms. Edwards, are there any registered voters within the area to be annexed to the CFD? And if so, how many? There are no registered voters. Ms. Edwards, if the owners of all taxable property proposed to the, be annexed to the CFD, have they agreed 
to hold the special election on December 16th, 2020? Yes, they have. Ms. Edwards, do you agree to hold the special election on December 16th, 2020? Yes, I do. Ms. Edwards, did we receive any written comments from the public? No, we did not. Ms. Duarte, did we receive any requests or, for oral comments? We did not, Mayor. Okay, the public hearing is now closed. And I will entertain a motion for this recommendation and you do not have to read it all. So that should incentivize you. <laughs> I'll move. Okay, can I get a second? Second. Okay, so Council Member Steiner moved and Vice Mayor Speak seconded uh, for the motion. Let's take an oral vote for this, Ms. Edwards. Mayor Casillas? Aye. Vice Mayor Speak? Aye. Council Member Daddario? Aye. Council Member Richens? Aye. Council Member Steiner? Aye. And that item passes five to zero. Okay, thank you. Ms. Edwards, have you received any ballots and have you canvassed the ballots and tallied the results? Yes, I received one ballot and all votes cast are in favor of levying special taxes. Wonderful. In that case, I will entertain a recommendation to adopt resolution number 2020-147. You also do not have to read this motion, so <laughs> move. any move, but okay. okay. Council Member Steiner has made the motion. Vice Mayor Speak has seconded. So, Ms. Edwards, can we take a roll call vote? Vice Mayor Speak? Aye. Council Member Daddario? Aye. Council Member Richens? Aye. Council Member Steiner? Aye. And that motion passes, item passes five to zero. I was a yes. I was a yes. So we're good. Okay. Um, public hearing on item number 28. It is a city council consideration of resolution number 2020-148, which is also a special election, and resolution number 2020-149, and declaring the results of those special elections for CFD number 2016-3 for maintenance services for the city of Corona on the proposition of an annual levy of special taxes within that territory proposed to be annexed. Public comment, uh, or the public can now submit a request for telephonic oral comment on item 28. The request period for item 28 will close at the conclusion of the item or after one minute from now has passed, whichever is sooner. Does the council want a staff report from this, on this item? Seeing none. Let's move forward. Um, Ms. Edwards, do you have proof of publication? Oh, sorry, the public hearing is now open for everyone who is just waiting on that. Um, Ms. Edwards, do you have proof of publication on and the mailing of the notice of the public hearing? Yes, I do. Okay, Ms. Edwards, have any written protests been received? No, I have not received any written protest. Ms. Edwards, are there any registered voters within the area to be annexed to the CFD? And if so, how many? There are no registered voters. Ms. Edwards, if the own, are the owners of all taxable property proposed to be annexed to the CFD, have they agreed to hold the special election on December yes. 16th? Sorry, yes, they have. <clears throat> Ms. Edwards, do you agree to hold the special election on December 16th, 2020? Yes, I do. Ms. Edwards, did we receive any written comments from the public? No, no, we did not. Uh, Ms. Duarte, did we receive any requests for oral comment? No, Mayor, we did not. Public hearing is now closed. And I will entertain a motion um, to adopt resolution number 2020-148 from my colleagues. Move. I'll second. Moved by Council Member Steiner, seconded by Council Member Richens, and we'll take an oral vote. Ms. Edwards? Mayor Casillas? Aye. Vice Mayor Speak? Aye. Council Member Daddario? Aye. Council Member Richens? Aye. Council Member Steiner? Aye. And that item passes five to zero. Thank you. Ms. Edwards, have you received any ballots and have you canvassed the ballots and tallied the results? 
Yes, I received one ballot and all votes cast are in favor of levying the special taxes. Okay, thank you. Um, I will now entertain a motion for the City Council to adopt resolution number 2020-149, declaring the results of the special election. Can I get a, a motion for that item? Move. Moved by Council Member Daddario. Second. Second. Second by Vice Mayor Speak. Um, Ms. Edwards, can we take an oral vote on that? Mayor Casillas? Aye. Vice Mayor Speak? Aye. Council Member Daddario? Aye. Council Member Richens? Aye. Council Member Steiner? Aye. And that item passes five to zero. Thank you. All right, moving on to legislative matters. There are none. Let's see, boards, commissions, committees. Um, we do have a few. The public can now submit a request for telephonic oral comment on the boards, commissions, and committees. The request period for each board, commission, and committee item will close at the conclusion of each item or after one minute from now has passed. We're treating these as one big group, so the, the one minute mark starting right now. We do not have any reports from the Planning and Housing Commission or the Parks and Recreation Commission. We do have a receive and file uh, from the Infrastructure Committee meeting, none from FLED, receive and file from Public Services, and receive and file, oh, we do have an update from um, Vice Mayor Speak from RCTC. <coughs> Am I Where's waiting this? or are we gonna? Um, oh, okay, let's go back. I don't know. Because we, we're treating them all as one, so we can take public comments at the end of all of them. So the floor is yours on item hey, 31. Great. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> we had our meeting uh, on, let's see, December 9th, because there's a meeting, it seems like every, there is a meeting every two weeks, it seems mm -hmm. like. Uh, we approved a Coachella, Coachella Valley rail service proposal that will bring an additional line to service to Coachella Valley. Um, that's basically just the, uh, the environmental's done. We need, we're gonna start working with the, um, uh, with the rail folks to ensure that we have room. Um, we have a new chairperson, uh, Jan Hartnick from uh, Desert Hot Springs. I'm sorry, not Desert Hot Springs, Desert Palm Desert. I'd be very upset if I said that. Um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, the want to give a little update on the 91 um, quarter operations project, the Green River Auxiliary Lane project. Um, we this week they started uh, some substantial closing, so those folks traveling at night, it'll, it'll be a little bit of deja vu back from. 2016 when there was multiple closures on the 91. Um, this week there'll be at least, let's see, it's Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, there'll be up to two lanes closed um, in, uh, in both directions on Thursday. So those of you traveling at night, please uh, subscribe to RCTC's, um, if you go to their website, you can subscribe to their updates. Um, I also send one out every either Monday or Sunday night um, with the impacts for both this project and the 15 project. Um, I did get a call from Ann Mayor yesterday about uh, some some issues. From uh, they have a they've limited travel on Green River west of uh, the trailer park there, and there are some residents. And <clears throat> frankly, I think they're not folks that are, are Coronans, but uh, they're they're down to a single lane. They're ensuring that they have bicycle path on both sides um, and a pedestrian path because it is you know as part of the Santa Ana River Trail. Um, they're working with our public works department to ensure that stays open for those folks and there aren't conflicts between the vehicles. They have a, a lighted uh, um, traffic control, they have a flag person, and we have a couple of um, not bright individuals that are blowing the lights and almost running over people, uh, running into construction traffic, and uh, they've all had a couple of near misses. Um, so uh, Ms. Mayor asked if ensured continue working with our public works department. I think uh, PD had somebody come out um, and and kind of look at the area, but if we can give a little bit of extra time, they're gonna try and get out of there as soon as possible. This this part of the project won't last too long. They're having to pour a pretty substantial footing um, for a uh, um, retaining wall, and that retaining wall, not a retaining wall, it's basically a sound wall that will prevent that sound from traveling in. So if we can just buy a little bit of patience from folks that are traveling that way and um, if you don't want to exercise patience, hopefully we have uh, somebody there that can give a pretty hefty ticket. So I, I appreciate it if, if uh, Mr. Ellis, I already spoke with you about it. I want to make sure that we have that in the in the queue. Yep. 
already followed up with PD on that. Thanks. Great. Thank you. That's it. Thank Wonderful. you, Ms. Thank you. Um, Ms. Edwards, have we received any written comments from the public on this section? Mayor, no, we did not. Ms. Duarte, did we receive any requests for oral comments? No, Mayor, we did not. All right. Then telephonic public participation is now closed, and we're moving on to administrative reports. The public can now submit a request for telephonic oral comment on item 32. The request period for item 32 will close at the conclusion of the item or after one minute from now has passed, whichever is sooner. Um, this administrative report is the um, council consideration to receive and file the auditor's report related to the fiscal year 2020 annual financial audits, auditor's comp communication, comprehensive annual financial report, development impact fees, annual report, and the annual report on voter approved debt for fiscal year ending June 30th, 2020. Do any of my colleagues want a staff report or have clarifying questions on this item? No. Councilmember Dario? No. Councilmember Steiner? Vice Mayor Speak? Nope. Okay, with that, Ms. Duarte, has it been a minute? Yes, Mayor, it has. We did not receive any requests. Thank you. Ms. Edwards, did we receive any written comments from the public on this item? Mayor, no, we did not. Okay, Ms. Duarte already said we did not receive any requests for oral comments. So then telephonic public participation is now closed for item 32. And I will entertain a motion for this item. So move. Move by Councilmember Steiner. Second. Second by Councilmember Richens. Can we take an oral vote, Ms. Edwards? Mayor, Mayor, we do not need a motion for this item. It is oh, to receive a file. Thank goodness. <laughs> thank you. I just got <laughs> stuck into the pattern of this thing. Ms. Edwards, um, I appreciate the guidance. Thank you so much. Moving on to last few items before we close out tonight's meeting. City Attorney's reports and comments. Mr. Durlis, do you have any comments? Uh, oh, I think you cut out. Tonight. Can you try that again, Mr. Durlis? Can you hear me now? Yes. No reports tonight. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, the audio is 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 troubling. <laughs> That's all right. Um, city managers' reports and comments. Mr. Ellis, do you have any comments? Thanks, Mayor. Just one quick comment. Just wanted to mention that this coming Monday, December twenty first, from eight to ten in the morning, businesses throughout Corona can learn the top five marketing strategies to grow their customer base and creatively promote their products and services. Um, this free webinar is presented by seasoned business marketing and branding specialists throughout Southern California who will lead participants through an easy how-to instructions on using the most effective marketing tools. This webinar is co-sponsored between the city and the Chamber of Commerce and is designed to support Corona businesses and encourage their ongoing success. Registration for this free webinar is available at mychamber.org. That is all my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ellis. Now, uh, City Council members' reports and comments. Uh, Council Member Richens. The, the election was in November, and we're halfway through December. So I've had a, a long time to think about being on this council. And just so the citizens know, it's, it's been a great transition. I've had calls from all of you. I've learned from all of you. And, and Jacob and, and the lawyers, or Dean, <laughs> pick, pick one. The, uh, the beauty of this was that I got to be elected by the citizens and knock all the doors. And I look forward to serving the city and I look forward to serving the citizens and hope to find the right balance. This is a beautiful city. My last comment is, uh, and I'm just sorry, Steiner, but I'm gonna throw a little history at you. We have Christmas, so we won't have another meeting until after Christmas. The The very first year of Corona, it was city founder Robert Taylor that bought every child in our city a Christmas present. And, and our city has been beautiful since 1886, and it's beautiful to now. I thank all of you. I thank the citizens, and Merry Christmas, or whatever holiday you celebrate or don't celebrate, to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Steiner? Yes, thank you. Um, so the ribbon cutting today was for the second all-inclusive playground at Santana Park. And that's uh, 
it was super cool. And um, it's nice that we can have some playgrounds now that children uh, in wheelchairs can access and, and play with, with the other kids. So I'm really proud of that. Um, as we, um, well, congratulations to Tom and Tony. Well done. As we move into the holidays, you know, please take, you know, some of Mr. Uffer's comments seriously as, as you gather or don't gather, but um, I do wish you all happy holidays and a Merry Christmas. Thank you. Council Member Daddario? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, um, wish everybody a, um, a Merry Christmas and happy holidays. Um, this is a much different view from up here than it is from back row where we normally are. And um, it's, it's not lost on me that I was um, elected to serve a community and those are the people that I report to and those are the people that I'm beholden to and I'm, I'm looking forward to the next four years. Thank you, Vice Mayor Speak. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the, I call it the holiday frame of mind. Um, you know, we have a, a, a plethora of wonderful organizations that do so much good, and, and not just this time of year, but especially this time of year, they go a little a little further. Um, you know, groups like the Settlement House that has been given back to Corona for over 100 years. Um, our faith-based communities, um, you know, the For the People group that uh, Fazia and Yusuf uh, live, have literally handed out over 100,000 pounds of food this year. Um, the fire department spark a love event, the Corona, B Corona PD's cops, uh, kids and cops uh, events, um, the hundreds of charities we have in town that consistently give back and, and they do so you know, all year long, but, not, not, but especially this, this, uh, this season. Um, but all these groups started with one idea, which was to be selfless and think of others that may be in need. And I heard a really great selfless story this week um, Daniel Merchant, a local 90, he celebrated his nine-year-old birthday two weeks before Christmas, and I have a cousin that celebrates their birthday uh, a couple weeks before Christmas, and they tell me it sucks because they have to share. They, you know, sometimes don't get, uh, you know, uh, two gifts. Um, not only did, uh, so Daniel celebrated his ninth birthday, you know, in COVID, did it socially distance with his friends. Um, he, uh, instead of, and so instead of doing a regular party, he had a, an ice cream truck that delivered um, basically ice cream to people. So these kids got ice cream. But instead of asking for a gift for himself, he asked for his friends to bring him a toy that they could donate. Um, didn't get a toy for himself. Um, in fact, went around the neighborhood and collected even more toys. And Corona PD's officers came and they picked it up and they contributed to their uh, uh, kids and cops toy drive. And, and I think that's kind of the... The spirit, and, and I, I, I'd be remiss to say that I don't think this is the only time this has happened. I think we have this happen a lot in this town. And that's, that's, a, that's how giving is pure and, and giving of yourself and, and giving of, um, of your time and, and wealth and, and energy is, is a, a, a wonderful thing. And so with that, I'd like to, again, wish everyone a, a happy holiday and um, and whatever uh, you celebrate in the next uh, few weeks. Um, and I hope you all enjoy it and everybody stays healthy and, and safe. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, I just want to echo uh, Mr. Uffer's words of, of, of caution and also encouragement. We are almost there. So please, please, please um, have a, a healthy, a safe holiday. Um, enjoy it. I know it's a little different this year, but um, but we're almost there, and it's going to take all of us kind of, you know, doing this together to get through it. So um, thank you. Um, be safe. Enjoy the holidays, and have a wonderful year. And with that, the meeting is adjourned to our next regular meeting of Wednesday, January 6, 2021.